Well, we should be good to go. I can and uh, Melissa, you can share your screen. OK, were you not seeing my screen? I am not seeing your screen now. OK, how about now? Can you see it now? I cannot. I don't know if others can. OK, let me try this one more time. Sorry. Screen one. There okay. we go. OK, That's great. Nice. OK, do you want to start us off, um, Jordan, with with introductions? Sure. So so welcome, everybody. Uh, congratulations first, everybody uh, for uh, for being selected to do to do this work. Uh, and we're all very much looking forward to working with you on this. Uh, this is an orientation meeting helping to uh, sort of bring you along on what to expect over the next at least over the next year or so with this project uh, that, that you have and how you're going to be engaging with different members of DOE and other national labs uh, who are going to be here to help support you as well as help uh, support DOE and the uh, making of the this research even more impactful than uh, than it ever could have been. So what we wanted to do first, though, and this is our second, uh, you know, engagement or second orientation uh, meeting that we've had. One thing that was useful that we did last week on Friday was we did some introductions uh, where the, the PI from each project or the PI's representative, whoever is on the calls today, could just give a brief, almost two sentence overview of your pro of, you know, who you are, what your project is and why it's important. So we're talking you know, very, very, very brief, uh, just so it helps put into context uh, so everyone knows what's what's the scope, what are the different types of projects that are happening. Um, you know, we don't want anything more than about two sentences. So um, per, I, what we did last time is if the, the PIs or the, the PIs representative uh, could, using Teams, raise your hand, and then we'll go in order uh, through, through each PI or, or PI representative uh, to give that brief introduction. And when you give you an introduction, if there's other folks that are on the on the call, uh, you know, you can introduce them or just say who else is, what are the other members of your team? So it looks like we've got Jeff who's raised his hand. Uh, that's good. A anyone else who is a, um, you know, if your PI is not here, then, you know, you, you might be the default PI rep representative for this call. All right, here we go. Um, so Jeff, why don't you, uh, uh, Jeff McCutcheon, why don't you kick us off uh, and, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Sure, uh, thanks Jordan uh, and thanks Melissa. I'm Jeff McCutcheon, I'm uh, in the Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering Department at the University of Connecticut and I'm PI of our project uh, looking at automation and digitalization of anaerobic digesters using a machine learning algorithm aided control strategy and approach. Uh, my co-PIs are Rajan Srivastava, uh, George Ballas, Matt Stuber, and Bai Kun Lee, uh, all at the University of Connecticut. Uh, and we are partnered with the Greater Lawrence Sanitation District, which runs a municipal anaerobic co-digester uh, in Massachusetts. And we're looking forward to working with uh, everybody at the uh, Water Tap team and hopefully some of you. All right, Jeff was the, the model. Uh... Model introducers. That was perfect, Jeff. Thank you so much. Uh, others can can follow. How about Benjamin Bostic? Hi there. Uh, my name is Benjamin Bostic. I am a professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. Our research project for here is to develop treatment technologies that are effective for especially arsenic and uranium combined um, problems, water problems that are essentially widespread across the Oglala Sioux Nation in, in South Dakota in, 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 and in North Dakota as well. Um, so we will be, we have a collaboration involving um, Dan Steingart here at Columbia, myself, and um, James Byrne at the University of Bristol in England to try to develop 
microbial technologies for media, more sustainable media creation and uh, monitoring. So I'll stop there. Great. Yes. Thank you. All right. That's that was excellent. All right, Jeremy, you are up next. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so uh, my name is Jeremy Guest. I'm an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So I'm here representing a project led led by Paige Novak at University of Minnesota with uh, Bill Arnold and Natasha Wright, all at Minnesota. And our focus is on uh, like a modular system to generate methane and hydrogen production from industrial wastewaters with a focus on food industry. Great, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. All right, Ganesh, you're up. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ganesh Rajagopalan. I'm from Kennedy Jinx Consultants, and our project is to divert more uh, ammonia from the wastewater influent into the digester using a cloth filter, and then extracting the ammonia using uh, ammonia that's produced in the digester using membrane evaporation process. Uh, the co-PA is Sahi Kath from Colorado School of Mines. And we are also collaborating with Baylor and uh, ASU in this project. Thanks. Right. Thank you. All right, Daramola. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Damilola Daramola. I'm an assistant professor at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. I am the PI for our project, which is focused on the combined nitrogen and phosphorus recovery from um, side stream treatment of um, municipal wastewater. And um, part of the project will also be on, on recovering this uh, resource and um, analyzing the, the performance on the resource in, in soil. And so um, the co-PIs are Dr. Tristan Trembley, who is um, a professor at Ohio University of Mechanical Engineering, and then um, Dr. Jared DeForest, who will be um, helping with the assessment is a soil biogeochemist, who will be helping with the assessment of the, of the resource. Uh, we're partnering with um, both, all those PIs at Ohio University, and we're partnering with um, the Athens Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is a rural wastewater treatment plant here in Athens, Ohio, and then with the Columbus Wastewater Treatment Plant as well. And we have a small business that will be helping with scaling up the technology. And I look forward to um, working with everyone. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Demilola. All right, Jeff Miller. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff Muller with the Water Research Foundation. I'm a research unit leader. Uh, we're located in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and our project uh, is titled Integration of Data-Driven Process Controls uh, for Maximization of Energy and Resource uh, Efficiency in Advanced Water Resource Recovery Facilities. So this project's going to uh, develop and demonstrate uh, data-driven process controls in three full-scale facilities. Uh, for five promising technology applications. And those five applications include carbon diversion, uh, biological nutrient removal, uh, disinfection with parasitic acid, um, phosphorus recovery using a technology called MagPrex, and then uh, holistic biosolids optimization. Our, our team includes uh, um, the Water Research Foundation, uh, Hampton Road Sanitation District, uh, DC Water, uh, MWRD in Denver, uh, West Point, uh, Michigan, uh, Northwestern University, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and Black and Beach. And I think uh, saw George Wells from uh, Northwestern University is on this call and a uh, member of our team. Great, thank you. And uh, the next on the list will be, is that Sabi Asachi? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Sibarsachi Das. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral scholar at Northwestern University. So I'm working with uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Dunn, and we are part of um, CoWork, which is an uh, abbreviation for Collaborative Water Energy Research Center. So it's a US Israel consortium. And within that, what we are responsible for is um, we are responsible for the life cycle assessment and techno, techno economic analysis of the various. Um, wastewater treatment and desalination technologies which are being developed there. Thank you. Great. And then uh, Christos. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Christos Maravellas. Uh, I'm a faculty member at uh, Princeton University. 
I'm a co-PI in a project that is led by David Jasby from UCLA. Uh, the partners are uh, UCLA, Princeton University, the LA Sanitation District, and then also South North America. And the goal is to, um, of this project is to produce uh, valuable chemicals and clean water uh, using a, a new technology, an electroactive anaerobic membrane bioreactor. Thanks. Okay, great. And uh, and then last but not least is Tay uh, Young. Yes, that's correct. Can, I hope you can hear me, right? Okay, yeah. I'll move on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, no, everyone. we can hear you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Tay Young Kim. I'm from Clarkson. I'm leading PI of the project, working on uh, investigating the use of bipolar membrane. Uh, to recover nutrients from uh, domestic wastewater treatment plant, including nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, our team, we have uh, Clarkson University's uh, two professors, Stefan Greenberg and Shane Rogers, and also Kevin Hickey uh, for technic uh, technical economic analysis. And we are going to install our scale up process in uh, our uh, partner located in New York, uh, the city of Cortland. Uh, uh, there's a uh, Bruce Adams is also a partner of this project. Thank you. OK, and so one thing that we did realize is that we had an updated link to the team's meeting. Uh, that we did that would allow us to record it, but it seems like some of the the participants never received that uh, never received that link. So in the old uh, meeting, we have fourteen people that are currently in that meeting that should be joining uh, any minute now. So this is uh, so we apologize for that, but I think we can expect um, a number of other folks to sort of trickle in as we uh, as we go. Oh, thanks for noticing that. I uh, I send the meeting update around, but I just assume that the calendar syncs or updates, but I guess it doesn't on everyone's computer the same yeah, way. It, it did on, I think it did on everyone on who is on this call, but maybe every all the 14 people who are not on this call, maybe it didn't. So they just sent an updated link. I was in the other meeting and I'm they they posted it in the chat. Uh, this is Brian Schoner from Black and Beach. Um, and where probably other people should be coming over to this meeting now. Right. OK, sorry about that. We had sent around a link maybe two days ago just so we can record the meeting, but I guess it doesn't sync well with various calendars. So apologies. OK, and I think, yes, yeah, Stephanie just said maybe if you were just had the forwarded link, then that would not automatically update. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I updated the link in the calendar, so the calendar update should have updated. Yep. And Jordan, if we're short on time, we can skip my intro um, and just jump into the, you know, the focus of today's meeting. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I think we have a little bit of a buffer built in and, and your part is short and I can keep mine short too. So I think we can just maybe, maybe we can go ahead and um, continue on. Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, it looks like we have a number of, Um, you know, new folks. I'm not sure if they're part of it, it, projects that have already been introduced or not. And I'm just getting a note that um, the chat in the other one was also disabled. So it was hard. He had to email individually people the link in order so they could they could come on. So 
let's give it another maybe one more minute or, or so before we, we continue on. OK. And then I think we should we, we might just have to go right into the uh, the overview right into your, your spot, um, Melissa. OK. Yeah, sorry about that again. So yeah, we only got the link through the chat and the other one we didn't get like even if you just set another email, we don't get it. So when you get a forward in Outlook, it's just a copy of the original message. You don't receive any updates no matter what. Oh, interesting because I sent it up. I updated the calendar invite, but I guess maybe that, that didn't. That work. doesn't change. Yeah, that doesn't change people who get a forwarded copy. Got it. Yeah. Sorry about that. OK, I think we have most of the people from the other meeting. There are a couple of people that I just couldn't get the new link to for one reason. Oh, or another. So yeah, one of them about 90 percent of them. Oh, wait, Bronco's on. OK, cool. Got it, thanks. OK, should I jump in to give sort of the high level context and then we can shift into the water, more specific water taps and dams? Um, yeah, I think that's a good so, yeah. OK, yeah, sorry again about the snafu with the meeting invite and the, the link to Teams, but um, hopefully because now we're taping this, um, which is why we changed it, it'll be available to like others on Teams that weren't able to make either a meeting. Um, so I'm just going to give a real quick kind of zoom out of, um, if I can change, yeah of what we're doing in you know, the advanced manufacturing office, why we're doing work in the energy water nexus. This might be confusing to people, uh, why the Department of Energy is involved at all in this and how we're thinking about you know, energy water um, and then you know, how the water taps and dams work kind of um, is hopefully gonna help us you know, inform future our d and needs in this space. And so we really appreciate these 16 projects giving us a healthy kind of baseline and, and targets going forward in the water wastewater treatment. Um, yeah, so uh, brief introduction of me though. I'm My name is Melissa Clambera. I'm a technology manager in the advanced manufacturing office. I've been at DOE for 17 years. Um, and I mostly work um, in uh, energy water space, um, but I also do work, my background is chemi, so I've been working on um, some of the work that we do in the circular economy of polymers, um, more like sustainable manufacturing. Um, and right now I actually just took over as a program manager leading the consortia team. So that's all of our manufacturing USA institutes hubs and other large consortia that we um, have started and, and will continue to invest, invest in in the advanced manufacturing office. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a high level overview of the energy water nexus and the work that we're doing and then the context of the water taps and dams work. And so uh, DOE just recently, um, I guess just maybe three or four years ago in the advanced manufacturing office, got involved in kind of this energy water space with, um, uh, and we started to think about, okay, well, if we're gonna do anything in this area, you know, what is the energy savings kind of play? And as we look at the, you know, our current water infrastructure, it's really built around these large centralized um, treatment facilities, most rel reliant on fresh water. And we're fortunate to have plenty of fresh water. Uh, well, we thought we had plenty of fresh water in the United States. That's cheap and easy to treat. Um, and there's various end users across the energy water nexus, municipalities, utility power sector, industry, ag, oil and gas, mining. Um, so for the past 100 plus years, this kind of model of relying on fresh water and more centralized treatment systems has kind of served us well but it's really breaking down under you know, water stress, drought, climate change, changing precipitation patterns, and aging infrastructure, increased competition for water resources. Um, and because of that, we wanna to try to think about, well, what, what are some of the investments we could be making to make our water infrastructure um, work for a 21st century? And bringing in some of these non-traditional water sources like um, seawater, brackish groundwater, 
um, to or wastewater and creating water reuse could help um, uh, reduce the energy intensity of water um, and also um, supplement our current freshwater sources. Um, but of course, if we start to treat non-traditional water sources, those are more, uh, they have more salinity, other constituents, and they're more energy and cost intensive to treat. And so how can we develop new technologies to, you know, drive down as much as we can the energy intensity and cost intensity of these technologies and maybe make some valuable co-products, um, which is a lot of the important work that you all are doing. And so how we, you know, you know, the reason we're doing all of this with these investments in new technologies in water, wastewater treatment is, again, trying to think about how do we create an infrastructure, water infrastructure for the 21st century that really serves all communities across the United States, all sectors, and, you know, makes it so that we're building back better, which is one of the themes of this administration, so that we can have smarter, wiser, more flexible and adaptive water infrastructure for the 21st century. And the main kind of investments that we've been making, at least in the Advanced Manufacturing Office, is um, on the top right is we work with a lot of existing facilities, um, manufacturing, um, power utilities, et cetera, municipalities, to help drive to help adopt existing technologies um, and make the, a value proposition around how there's sort of off-the-shelf technologies that they could be um, you know, adopting now to improve their water efficiency, but we also look at energy efficiency too in our what we call our technical partnerships or technical assistance program. And there's other tools that they provide to existing facilities to help do kind of energy and water audits. Um, and provide a better understanding of what existing um, technologies are out there that are available for adoption. Um, in the bottom is more the work that we're doing to make non-traditional water sources more available at pipe parity. And those are investments such as the National Alliance for Water Innovations, which is an early stage R&D hub that was just started two years ago, um, led by Lawrence Berkeley with NREL and Oak Ridge and NETL. Um, which you know, that's how we started the water taps and water dams tools as part of that hub. And we wanna make it more broadly used um, by the research community. And in the upper left is, um, you know, really looking at water, wastewater from, you know, the opportunity to recover um, resources. Um, as we treat this water, um, how can you recover energy, nutrients, um, fertilizers, other chemicals, um, from water, wastewater facilities um, or other facilities. And those are the 16 projects that we selected from the funding opportunity earlier this year that you're all are, are a part of. You're really kind of populating for the first time a large investment in that portfolio in the advanced manufacturing office. And so this is just a high level quick synopsis of, I already touched on the National Alliance for Water Innovations, looking at these non-traditional water sources, I mentioned the technical partnerships work that we're doing with existing industry. These are really volunteer programs that provide tools and technical assistance um, to kind of make, a, make the case for why uh, existing facilities should adopt technology, you know, commercially available technologies to improve their water efficiency and energy efficiency. Um, and then the 16 projects, which you are all part of in the advanced water resource recovery R&D and pilots. And then, you know, really what we're trying to do here, because it's such a new area for at least the advanced manufacturing office to be making these large investments, you know, nearly 100 and, um, you know, 40 million uh, and growing is trying to give us a better understanding of a baseline of what does our current water infrastructure look like as far as, you know, energy intensiveness and um, how can we make it better, especially because this administration is really interested in decarbonization or reducing our GHG emissions. What are some of the opportunities more broadly in the water infrastructure to really think about um, how we can get at um, net zero uh, or net positive in the 21st century water infrastructure and make it more you know, resilient and intelligent and integrated with renewables. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities there. And the technologies that you're working on are 
giving us a better understanding of, you know, what is what are some new innovative technologies that could get us there um, as compared to what the current state of technology is. And one of the things that this will help inform too is we have about 10 or 12 million left over um, from appropriations in FY21, which we're nearing the end of. And we see an opportunity for, a, I think 20 more million in the house mark for FY22. And so we're trying to think about, you know, a $30 million investment in our D&D &D, um, to run another kind of competition. And these kind of TA, LCA analysis tools, another strategic analysis that we do could help inform where some of those opportunities are. And we're trying to develop a workshop that we would do, which you would all be invited to um, sometime in the December, January timeframe to get your input and other stakeholders input on um, what you think some of those rich topic areas are that we should focus on um, for this future kind of funding opportunity or competition. Okay, so that's kind of a high level context from the DOE side. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Jordan. I think he's on the agenda. Yeah, thanks Melissa. Uh, yep. All right, so I'll be brief uh, and go give you sort of a, an overview of, of what to expect today and, and how all, uh, all of your, your teams are gonna be working together with the lab teams. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll pass it over to them individually to hear about them, so. Just quickly, was there a question? I see someone has a hand raised. Or is that left over from before? OK, I guess that was left over. Great. And can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yes. OK, great. All right. So just building off uh, of what Melissa just said, you know, as a reminder, you know, the work that you're doing is really focused on, you know, performing cutting edge, re cutting edge research as well as providing insight into future DOE investments. As Melissa said, you know, they've already invested $140 million. You know, if we want to invest more, where are those sweet spots? Where are those areas that, uh, that would be, be most impactful? Your work's going to be helping to do that. Uh, and you're going to be hearing today from, from different support teams from both NREL and NETL uh, that can help support you. And they, we're going to be using these standardized tools and methods that were developed under the, the National Alliance for Water Innovation or NAWI project. Uh, so we're, we're sort of building off what has already been done with that NAWI effort. Uh, again, the hope from this is that we, we are maximizing the impact of your research, not only for you, you know, academically and industry wise, uh, but again, also for uh, other cascading impacts that we might see throughout DOE of, of really recognizing, hey, this is a very promising area uh, that can can use some more more support for developing new, new research. There's going to be three primary areas where we're going to be engaging you throughout the throughout the next year, and you're going to be hearing from each of these three teams. The first is related to baselining, and so this is really focused on assessing the context of where your technology sits. What are some you know competing technologies? What are what's the you know the situation in which uh, you know, a, a utility or, or industrial water user or wastewater treater might find themselves in. So that's what the baselining effort is. It's being led by Parth of Kurup and Mike Talmadge of NREL. Uh, you'll hear about that next. The second primary area is, is more focused on modeling. So whereas baselining tells us where we're starting, modeling helps us better understand what might be the impacts of your different technology advancements. And so uh, this is where, you know, we'll need to represent your technology, if it's not already represented in WaterTap, uh, we'll need to make sure we're able to, um, you know, uh, tweak the right levers, uh, you know, pull the right levers to make sure we can uh, represent those technologies and the impacts they might have. That's sort of the modeling aspect. David Miller and Tim Bartholomew from NETL are leading that effort. And then lastly is we want to make sure that there's, you know, a, a high impact place in which where you can disseminate the data as well as a, a secure place where you can store data if as needed. Uh, and this is with the water dams platform. Uh, and John Weirs is here today to, to, from NREL to talk a little bit more about that platform. So one thing that you'll see uh, as each of these three teams talk to you is that we are, even though I've, I've sort of broken them down and compartmentalized them here into three areas, they are really, we all really are one team and we're all working together. Uh, and it's it's really going to be a joint effort as we engage you. Uh, you know, we're we're going to be minimizing meetings and making sure we we sort of address these things at one time. 
And the last thing that is important to note is that, you know, each of your project needs uh, will be slightly different. So, uh, and we heard that in the introductions where we, you know, basically heard about nine different technology types. Each of those is, is going to have a different status, going to have a different baseline. Uh, so, you know, there's going to be more or less work needed uh, to come up with that baseline and to do that modeling. And so, uh, you know, from here on out, we don't expect too many more joint meetings like this. It'll be a lot more one-on-one -on -one meetings where we'll work directly with you to really see what, what you need and how we can best, best help. So I want to just sort of visually show that as well too. So in this black box is, is sort of you and your project team, uh, you know, do, doing your research. You will be engaging, you know, with the NREL team on, on the baselining and tracking templates. So uh, you are, you know, going to be required to sort of share your baseline and show your progress with DOE. We'll be helping you with, with developing that template so, so you know what, what to send to DOE um, as well. And that's happening at, at the exact same time as we're developing that model. You know, we're all working together to represent your, your technology, its context, its baseline, as well as look at, you know, what might be some opportunities you have uh, for advancements or expectations you have for, for advancements. All the data that, you know, that you're going to be using and any data that you end up publishing uh, or want to share publicly, you know, can be stored in this in the water dams framework. And so uh, water dams is a you know secure platform meant to, designed to be used not only for internal uh, data management, but also really for dissemination and sort of a one stop shop for disseminating water research information. Um, as I mentioned, you are going to be you know required to submit things to DOE, you know, uh, on your baselines, on your progress being made. We will be helping you in this first year and then eventually you'll be able to do this all by yourself and, and sort of update that template that we're creating. And the last thing about water dams is again, it's it's really, you know, a primary focus is this public dissemination, uh, but it does have uh, key features associated with internal secure uh, data storage and usage uh, if that's useful for you. A big issue, you know, that we want to make sure we're clear about from the beginning is is related to security and confidentiality. So all of the staff that you're working with from, you know, from the labs uh, either already have or will sign, you know, a standard NDA uh, for protecting sensitive data. This is the, what we've used within the in NAWI, the National Alliance for Water Innovation efforts. Uh, for almost every single project within NAWI, that's been sufficient. Uh, but some projects have requested some additional, you know, protection or some additional agreements being signed, and so we've been able to accommodate that. We'll do a, use a similar approach here, where uh, if an additional agreement beyond our standard NDA is needed, um, we'll work with you and we'll do that, and we'll, you know, we'll we'll do that on a case by case basis, just to make sure everyone on your project team feels comfortable uh, with with how we have that arranged. Um, other important thing to note is, you know, we are going to be developing, you know, open source tools as part of this. Uh, or continuing to develop op open source tools, and that will lead to new modeling capabilities that we have. Um, and some of those capabilities will re be represented in that open source tool, but no proprietary data or information or you know other trade secrets are going to be shared uh, openly. Nothing without uh, any of your your consent on that. Um, and then lastly, the as I mentioned before, Water Dams has a you know a sort of a, a data internal data sharing platform called Water Found or the Data Foundry, um, which is, you know, secure, uh, meets all DOE cyber security, uh, you know, requirements. Uh, and then when you're ready uh, for the data that that can be, you know, submitted pub or, you know, disseminated publicly after you've published a paper, uh, that can go th right through water dams. So the next steps uh, that we have for all of you are uh, finalizing contract and official project initiation. So I think most of you hopefully already have your your contract finalized. Some of us um, on on the support team are still finalizing the, those contracts, uh, but we anticipate that happening this week or, or next week, hopefully. But that's really the, that first step. The second thing that's going to happen is there's going to be some introductory meetings uh, uh, with NREL, the NREL and NETL teams with each of you. And these will be individual uh, meetings with 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 each project. Um, and it'll be the, you know, the baseline, the modeling and the data teams all together. We want to complete these by November 15th. Uh, so we have a better understanding of sort of where you're at, what sort of support you need, what technology you have in what context it's being used. Uh, and again, yeah, we're going to be coordinating and our, our job is really to during these meetings is assess what you actually need, 
what status you're at, how much data you already have, how much modeling you, might, you maybe have already done. Are you starting from scratch uh, or do you have a, a sort of a wealth of, of background information already? Uh, and then we'll develop that engagement plan and timeline. Uh, there will be some training that'll be that'll be required, as well as then user support throughout the rest of the year. So that's sort of the what to expect over the next year. Again, in the next six weeks, we're gonna we are gonna be wanting to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you, uh, and then from there we'll develop a more tailored custom plan uh, for working with each of you. So that's what I have. Uh, if, if there's any other you know comments people might have for me, otherwise I'd like to to pass this along to. Uh, Parth and Mike to talk a little bit more about the um, the baselining activity. Jaron, looks like you got a question from Jeff. All right, uh, Jordan, this may be answered in the in the next section, but I just want to know when the baselining template will be available. Yep, so we're going to be developing that uh, over the next quarter, so that'll be ready sometime this fall. We'll have that ready. Great, thank you. OK, uh, Parthiv, are you sharing or, or would you like me to share today? I'm going to go with I'll share because let me see if the connection works and stuff. Let's hope. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, can you see Mike? Can everyone see? We got you. Okay, yep. excellent. Okay, so I'll give a, I'll just start this off and then Mike will also jump in as well. So we'll be really just highlighting some of the TEA baselining target development and tracking activities that are coming. We should be done in about 10 to 12 minutes. Okay, so Myself, for example, I I work a lot on techno-economics, typically for things like water, but also um, solar and industrial process heat. Um, Mike, do you want to give a quick intro as well? Sure. Uh, my background is also techno-economic analysis and and process modeling. I, I do most of my work in the the bioenergy um, aspects. Uh, so, so looking at biofuels production from biomass resources and things like that. And then I had the opportunity to work with Parthiv in the, the early stages of, of NAWI on, on baselining and um, some, some sort of Excel-based process modeling and techno-economics. So uh, excited to, to kind of share what we learned and, and, and apply that in these uh, new project efforts. Thanks, Parthiv. Yeah. So in terms of, thank you, Mike, uh, in terms of why we're here today. We're really going to be focusing on giving an introduction. It's an orientation for understanding, OK, all of the projects need to have specific baselines and specific tracking of progress. So that's important. And as Jeff just asked, this template will be developed. We'll, we'll work with you on that one. Uh, the idea behind a consistent techno-economic analysis framework is that it gives people the basis and comparative capabilities uh, between projects. And then of course, DOE and Melissa and others are able to really see the potential impacts of the technology and the research as well. These are very standard approaches that we use as uh, Mike highlighted for many different technology types from solar to wind and specifically for uh, water treatment and uh, uh, resource recovery as well. So we will definitely work with each of the teams here to really train people on how to update their templates once ready. Mike, do you want to give a quick TEA sure. primer? Yep, so I always kind of start with a TEA image and it sounds like most everyone is is pretty familiar with techno-economic analysis and that is simply the, the you know, the combining of, of process modeling and economic aspects of, of the, the, the project that you're you're seeking to model. 
And really our, our goal there is to quantify cost of production and, and the environment environmental impacts. And what this consistent modeling platform and um, really modeling and financial analysis plant, platform enable is a level playing field um, <coughs> upon which all of these different processes, and it sounds like there's a very diverse mix of, of projects that have been awarded here. So that's very exciting. Um, and, and all of these projects have different treatment technologies and water sources and tar target co-products and those things. Um, but essentially the TEA is intended to provide a level playing field by which all of these can be compared. Um, as I mentioned, or we both mentioned that Parthiv and I have had the opportunity to work with the, the baseline teams in Nawi, where the primary metrics of focus there were levelized cost of water and energy intensity um, as that was really, you know, primarily focused on water production by desalination technologies from, from a variety of different sources. Um, so, so here it'll be uh, very interesting to, to learn what you guys are exploring and then figure out how we're, how we're going to create this, this idea of letting levelized level playing field across the board. Um, let's see, we can jump to slide four. So in the case of this AMO funded um, effort, the, the Nettle team is really going to be providing all the support for process modeling and, and the economic analysis as well, because they're they're really the owners of, uh, of, of the water tap and IDEAS framework at this point, which, which they'll talk in detail about. However, Parthiv and I um, have had some experience, as I mentioned, in TEA work and, of course, the initial years of NAWI in facilitating the development of, of a lot of baseline uh, studies and the establishment of, you know, you know, the appropriate metrics that are needed to quantify and kind of track progress for those those baseline technologies. Um, and so while our role is here is really not the modeling at our TEA, we hope that our experience will help um, the project teams and uh, Nettle to kind of accomplish these major steps of, of, of associated with metrics. Um, target definitions and progress tracking through the course of your, your R&D project effort. So, so that's really our role here is to help you um, establish the benchmarking uh, system and then to help you kind of uh, enable you to track that throughout the course of your project. So um, a quick kind of just a summary over there on the left of the, the major aspects of R&D focused TEA. So, will really be helping you, I think, through the initial three steps of that to, to, to identify what the process basis is, what is a representative baseline scenario representing the current state of technology for, for what you're going to be working on, and then establish those costs. And then, of, of course, we'll help with coordination and, and data collection as you, you work with the, the Nettle team to do, do the actual modeling. All right, let's jump to, uh, yeah, and then just a couple of graphical examples over on the right. So, so um, on top, just typical waterfall plot that we can use to, to track progress specifically for, um, you know, a cost metric. This is a production cost that uh, is applied in the biofuels area, dollars per gasoline equivalent. Um, and then on the bottom is just an example of some sensitivity analysis um, that, that we can do in TA models to understand the most, pit, most impactful um, input parameters, if you will, on the, the resulting metrics. All right, now we can jump to slide five. Okay, so the image is, is just a very simple generic representation of the kind of dashboards maybe that we're, we're going to be seek, seeking to develop with the project teams in Nettle. Um, so again, all of the, the inputs and outputs for the modeling effort will go through um, Nettle, and then we'll again help quantify or, or help identify the right metrics and then help set up the, uh, the the templates to enable you to do this on your own as as you progress through the project. So our roles become one to help set up the baselines, identify um, current state of technology and define the metrics, facilitate development of progress. Um, of, of these progress dashboards and tracking tools for the project teams to utilize through the project. And, and one thing I think that we're, we're that this effort should really help you guys do is to help with reporting to DOE. So these kind of standard templates are intended to make that, you know, your progress reporting back to DOE simple. And that, that's 
um, you know, one area that we can hope we can hopefully help. Uh, next slide. I don't want to dive too deeply into this, but this is me just intended to get you all to start thinking about the types of data that we're going to need, um, and we're going to start kind of pulling from you uh, to, to help get things going on the baselining effort, uh, establishing the targets, and then also, of course, the data flow to the Nettle team that, that they'll be requiring to do the actual modeling. Um, so that's it for me, I think, Parthiv, unless there are any uh, questions or comments. No, thank you. Thanks, Mike. So I will just pause for a, not a, just to give some context. Um, when Mike and I have mentioned that baselines have been done and created, currently eight alternative source waters have had baselines created. And in that, there are over 25 different case studies of real specific applications as well. So there's a lot of richness in the water tap three tool already on specific unit process models, both for uh, water treatment, um, waste recovery, and resource recovery as well. But that's the if new models are going to be needed, that'll be through NETL, but we will definitely help figure out what is needed for um, the metrics of that. And it looks and like so Jeff has continue? a question. Uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff, is it the same question? Yeah, sorry, I always have questions. Apologize. Um, this is this is actually a great primer on the kinds of things that you'd be looking for, and kind of like an overview of the of the baseline template. My question is regard to these particular data inputs. Um, these can vary widely based on, say, system size or uh, or really based on the boundary conditions that you that you list as one of the metrics as well. How much data input would be required to get a reasonable baseline because you could have a baseline with en enormous error bars essentially representing a wide variety of say wastewater treatment plant operations which which can vary widely can how do you sort of hone in on what the baseline actually is or do you take subsets of the treatment processes and try to baseline individual subsets great yeah. question so mike why don't you yeah yeah, so I think I think there's some flexibility there. I, I, my my initial gut response is kind of either or or both. I mean, um, variability or um, uncertainty data, I, I would say, is is also really important, and I think can can bring a lot of value. Um, you know, we maybe Tim and and uh, David can also address this, but. There is, I think, some some opportunity to sort of model and and understand the the impact on probability of the output metrics, if you will, as a function of the the, the probability of the input metrics. So maybe Tim and, and David could address that one uh, in more detail from the sort of the modeling standpoint. But when I think about that from a baseline, I th I, I think either or both would would be possible. And actually, um, related to that, Jeff. So already for the specific unit processes that are in there, there are specific ranges. So for example, based upon the size of facility or based upon the specific unit process, we may or may not have a wide range. In some cases, the range for each of those unit processes along the treatment train is narrow. For example, on the RO side or some sort of key um, you know, bed or cleaning, cleaning and polishing step, that gap is smaller because of the data we already have. But we would also ask you the question when we're doing the interviews and kickoffs, how do you want your system to have a baseline? Because if it's a certain size that you're already going for, then that creates something to let's say, compare against. But we will need to discuss with you on how to have a targeted baseline as well. Yeah, that's interesting because if you look at more, say, distributed systems that are smaller versus centralized systems that are larger, your baselines could be wildly different in a particular TEA metric. Um, and actually, that in itself is useful information 
if you are going to make decisions about technology development. So I look forward to seeing how those baselines emerge with different size systems, particularly. Jeff, def, I mean, one critical aspect of, of any process model or, or kind of optimization effort, which this I think ultimately leads to, is capital scaling. So what's the scalability of these processes? So like that is definitely something that we're going to harp on you uh, for. Um, you know, are there capital scaling curves essentially that exist for these processes? If not, then can we lever leverage similar technologies and look at the scalability of those? Um, so, so yeah, we're we're definitely going to get into the details there. Yeah, great, good point. Uh, Tim and. Tim will be able to talk more about Tim and David will be able to talk more about the specific process level perspective when we get to that uh, presentation. So Jordan also felt it was worthwhile, and I also do as well, that you know what are the key interactions between the PIs, AMO, and also NREL and NETL. And so NREL and NETL will really work with the project PIs first to learn about your pro your project, your processes, your uh, current state effectively, so that we can help you figure out what that baseline is. And as Mike highlighted, NETL will really be the ones undertaking the data collection with the AMO PIs. Of course, having the data, you can help them by giving it to them and making sure that it's securely transferred via dams. NREL will also, as Mike mentioned, help develop the baseline and reporting template for the projects and NETL. Um, this is kicking off now, but realistically, I'll show you the timeline next as well. So that's, that's again that type of iterative interaction. We are being um, we're making these, we will eventually make these templates to make sure that you as the PIs are the ones able to fill it in by working with us uh, and also NETL. Now, the data requests that we make, you will work with NETL on making sure that it's then built into the, into the public model. Again, the NET the NREL team will help train the project PIs on uh, updating TEAs and the modeling platform, and specifically things like you know, how do you how do you look at the different metrics that you're interested in, levelized cost of water and energy intensity and resource recovery. So, for example, dollar per kilo of product or some sort of you know, revenue metric, depending on what is possible. Uh, we will also provide some user support for the tool as well. But of course, NETL will be heavily involved in that. When we look at the timeline, which is from now until, you know, 12 months into the project, you will be first approached by uh, Jordan and the others to set up kickoff meetings with NREL and NETL so that we can start understanding uh, the project. Then there will be individual meetings as well set by the 15th of November. And some of the key model inputs and requirements will be understood better. So uh, Mike and I will start developing the template as Jordan mentioned, and then the AMLPIs will start finding and adding that uh, data to the template, for example. One of the key things that will be needed in the first quarter also will be from NETL to identify some of these key model changes that will be uh, made. So in months four to six, this is probably in the new year, looking at getting the template going, having an initial te technology representation created pre-research. And what I mean by pre-research is, as you saw in that waterfall chart, the whole purpose of a system level techno-economic analysis is to understand if you changed specific parts of 
that system or that, that treatment train, it leads to potential future outcomes. And so that's, that's why it's important to start with a baseline. In months seven to nine, we're expecting that the model modifications will really be done and finished, and then training for the AMO PIs can uh, really be undertaken as well. The progress can be logged, for example, using the template, uh, and the PIs are expected to have their trainings completed. Jordan will provide uh, further details on that when ready. In months 10 to 12, we're expecting that the TEA would really be finished and that it would be compared to the baseline so that you have an idea of how uh, your research can be quantified and the impact can be looked at in the future. For example, the levelized cost of water, the energy intensity, and so on. Uh, the, it is important that a final summary of these initial baselines and opportunities are then provided to DOE as well. Um, and as you can see, all the training should be completed by the end of the year, uh, end of those 12 months. Now, in terms of some of the key milestones, as uh, Mike was highlighting, the key identification of the technologies will be important. Like, what do, you, what do we need to change? What does NETL need to change? Q2, really looking at some of that characterization. Q3, the training needs to be completed. And Q4, the summary of the baselines uh, provided. Jordan, have I anything else to add? No, I think that was good. Thank you. Um, Thanks a lot. Yeah, and I think in the interest of time, uh, we can move on to Tim and um, and David to talk through the, the modeling activity. We do have a question, though, from Christos about does a PI have to complete all the trainings or someone from the team? I think it's it's just someone from the team, whoever is going to be responsible for, um, you know, for, for doing that, that analysis and doing that reporting. That would be the person who would we do want to make sure it does the trainings. Then I'll share my screen. Just got that. Can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Awesome. All right. So um, David and I are from NETL, and I'm going to be talking about this tool, WaterTap. Um, and how it is associated with this project. And so WaterTap was developed by NAWI with the intention to do predictive analyses of early stage treatment technologies. So these analyses could be things like estimate performance metric, extract design and operation guidelines, identify bottlenecks, estimate a range of outcomes. Examples of these could be you vary two decision variables and see what it has, uh, what impact it has on an outcome metric, like the product cost for um, Waste, like waste recovery. Um, this would be a simulation where you're changing these things individually, but WaterTap is built on this platform called Ideas, which is really designed for optimization. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but uh, generally we feel like we'll be able to optimize these decision variables um, instead of vary them. Um, and then we could vary parameters like the feed concentration and the resource recovery, whether that's like 80% or even like 15% and see what type of impact that has on outcome metrics like the product cost. Uh, we also can do sensitivity analysis, like you vary a parameter and see what impact it has, and then stochastic sensitivity analysis to get a range of outcomes. And so while we can do this for an individual technology in isolation, one of the bigger goals is to do this for a full treatment train, which as we know, have a whole bunch of other processes. Um, this slide was developed um, for NAWI, which is a desalination process where we have seawater desal. It has a variety of pretreatment processes um, with chemical treatment and filtration. We have a desalination section for two stage reverse osmosis, and then uh, another polishing step and post treatment chemical processes. And so there's all these unit operations, and they impact each other. Um, and so uh, in your guys' individual projects, you have different technologies, maybe a suite of technologies, and it's really important to connect all of them while doing this type of modeling. And this is specifically what WaterTap 
is designed to do. Um, this is generally usually fairly difficult because you need to build a model of all these different things. Um, but WaterTap is collecting a library of a variety of water treatment um, and wastewater recovery processes. Um, and so this, is, this development of these models is funded by NAWI on one side and then also this AMO project here. Um, and these are just some examples of uh, technologies we could probably, that will populate this library. Um, now we've focused on desalination technologies, and in our first year we've developed uh, several cross-flow filtration, chemical treatment, and dead-end filtration processes um, that are associated with desal. Um, these, these models can also be paired with other model libraries. Um, I'm going to talk about the IDEAS platform in a moment. But IDEAS uh, has its own model library where it has a variety of different processes that are useful to connect also up with water tap processes, like mixers and splitters, which is really common in water processes, pumps, um, and then a variety of uh, chemical reactors that are actually used as the basis of the NAWI chemical treatment uh, models that are used. And the idea is with these two model libraries, we can do uh, process design and optimization on a flow sheet simulation and optimization platform, which is the IDEAS um, integrated platform. And so this is a software product, that's a tool that's been developed at NETL and other national labs. Um, that is an advanced process systems engineering uh, platform. So this means you can connect modular models that you get from a library and do simulation optimization and assess the technology. Um, it's had tens of millions of dollars of investment over the last six years. And so there's a lot of other capabilities that are um, good too. And ones that are relevant for this project are dynamic modeling, um, like something like closed circuit reverse osmosis, conceptual design, where instead of setting up the full treatment drain, um, you allow an, uh, an algorithm to uh, determine what the connectivity uh, is optimal. And then we have other capabilities as well, like controls, surrogate modeling, and uncertainty quantification. And the power of IDEAS um, has been developed for a while, but it's also built on another uh, highly invested DOE project called PIMO, which allows us to represent these models um, in an algebraic modeling language, which means as you would write a model on paper with uh, constraints, equations, variables, and parameters, you can represent that in Python and be able to connect with a whole suite of commercial and open source solvers, which are highlighted on the, the bottom right. This is just a few of the options, but uh, generally a lot of solvers um, uh, can uh, interact with PIMO models. Um, and this is really gives IDEAS a lot of its power because these commercial solvers um, allow us to take advantage of the advances in um, solving complex models um, over the last couple decades. When a lot of typical traditional tools use uh, much more simple solvers that can't handle as complex models. Um, I would say in all, the order estimate of how much more efficient these types of models are, or solvers are, is like uh, three to four orders of magnitude um, better at solving different problems. So, in this project, our main goal, we're not, we're, we're just trying to populate models that are relevant to your project for uh, what in WaterTap. And so we have to develop these models, and there's four steps. There's plan, build, verify, and refine. And let's go through a little more details on each of these. So in the planning process, we identify process phenomenon, applications, modeling approaches, and data sources, and prioritize a hierarchical development. So uh, in WaterTap, we oftentimes have uh, a range of options for the same treatment technology, um, from simple to complex, um, and then also curating these relationships and data and justifying assumptions. Building, we have to represent the system of equations and unit property and reaction models that are IDEAS compatible. That's that platform. And create necessary structural components and create documentations on the model use limitations. Verifying, we ensure that the model performs as expected across the applicable domain and check that the results are similar to other modeling approaches or justify the difference. And then 
This goes to refine where we update model data, consider additional phenomenon, include additional decision variables, and relax simplifying assumptions. So this is some of the cyclical process, and it'll just continue over uh, the period of this project. Um, for who's responsible for what, um, the individual projects, your teams are responsible um, for being highly engaged and leading the planning and refinement of these models. Whereas NETL, we're primarily responsible for building it and verifying that it was implemented as expected. Although sometimes we might need some help with verifying uh, just to check with you guys are the domain experts um, in making sure that the models are correct and that they're functioning properly. Um, then, okay, so th that's the general um, framework and how this will happen throughout the year is uh, we'll have an initial individual project meet modeling meeting by November 15th um, where we do some um, uh, you know, scoping and getting a general sense of what the project is like. And from then on, we'll have regular monthly meetings for coordinating the planning and the refinement steps that I was describing earlier. And at the highest level, the project goal um, for a three-year project or some projects are two years um, is to develop a multi-hierarchical model for the core and associated technologies that's fully integrated with the IDEAS platform and can be used for detailed techno-economic techno assessment. In the short term, we'll develop initial zero-order models for the project. And what I mean by zero-order is that um, sometimes uh, the, the simplest models you can assume like a parameter of a performance of the technology rather than linking the decision variables um, and doing calculations to calculate that performance. Um, and so sometimes these are very useful for still setting performance targets, even though we don't have uh, the detailed calculations to lead up to that. But over time, we expect to develop these detailed models um, and especially focusing on prioritized processes. Um, and so this progress will depend on a variety of things, um, including minimum functional requirements, which are the, you know, the baseline things that have to be considered in order to appropriately model uh, the technology, the data availability, and the suitability with the current platform, which is IDEAS and WaterTap. So the mid-year goal, which is at the end of March 2022, is that for all the projects, we have a basic model that spans the key metrics um, and the decision variables of the core technology. Um, however, we're not committing to, it, it might not have predictive relationships for all of the key metrics, right? Um, some of them we might have to vary with our sensitivity analyses to see and set those targets um, instead of being directly tied to decision variables. Um, and the last thing before I open this up to questions is what do you need to do before uh, the initial modeling meeting? It'd be good for you guys to have a general sense of identifying the key process phenomenon, decision variables, and outcome metrics of the technologies that you guys are studying, the applications, so the feed water composition and the product requirements, a range of modeling approaches for that technology, um, if possible, because uh, we eventually want to do a simple to complex hierarchical development, and then potential data sources for unit models and property model parameters. Um, and the last thing is the minimum functional requirements. And I gave a little example about this before, but some other examples would be um, some processes are inherently dynamic, um, right? So like dead end filtration, which constantly the operation changes um, when you're filtering uh, because the, the membrane gets uh, clogged up. So you have to keep increasing pressure and then you eventually backwash it and clean it out. That is an inherently dynamic process. And so the, that type of modeling of that process requires dynamics. Um, a lot of other processes like reverse osmosis and things like that, you can do a decent techno-economic assessment with a steady state model. Um, and so getting a good sense of those things uh, are really important. And that's the end for the NEPL side. It's our contact information, but I'll open that up for questions. Jeff had a question about model validation, Tim. 
yeah. about model validation against real systems and if that's embedded in the workflow that you discussed or if it's outside of that. So that model validation step can be in this refinement where if we're and some of them verify, right? If if the, the models are not performing or not matching real world expectations, uh, that means we either have to update the model parameters and or get a new form and consider different phenomena. So that's kind of in there. Um, I would say I've done some model validation projects and it, uh, it takes a lot of effort. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we can incorporate that as we go um, if the data is available and things like that. Yeah, thanks, Tim. The reason I asked the question is because in the verify feature of this workflow, you are checking that against other modeling approaches. Um, but ultimately, these models have to reflect performance of real systems. And if you're talking about, say, we see a lot of projects in this in this uh, grouping of biological processes, for instance, which are notoriously difficult to model. Um, and so having having a lot of having more data on 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 real system operation could help uh, sort of tune your model a little bit to be more accurately predicting what might happen in these complex environments. Yeah, correct. But to be clear, uh, at least from our side of things, we would not be finding that data, right? Are you, are you suggesting that maybe the individual project groups have will maybe have access to validation data? I mean, I, I think yeah, I mean, if you're looking at, say, wastewater treatment systems and all of the associated components and processes for either pre or post treatment of the water or its or other materials from the water, municipalities regularly publish data on the performance of their systems. There should be lots of data available for how a system is performing, say, under various perturbations. Um, and, and you could see how a system might 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 react uh, to those perturbations, giving you an understanding of how your model might also or should also react um, with a, with some particular output metric. I think picking the right output metrics is one of the most challenging things to understand, like what what is really important. But then understanding how the input metrics and but affect those output metrics in real systems will be a better verification strategy or validation strategy than than comparing to existing models, which may be few in an option. So that, that, that's all I'm, I'm, I was, that, that, that was just seeing that made me kind of maybe think about like where that was in this workflow. I see. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, at least on our side of things, we are not planning on doing extensive data a model validation effort. Um, although for individual projects, if it's uh, if the data is available and it project teams help us identify that and then use that with the models, it could be done on the process. Thank you. OK. I know that we have one more presentation, so I'll hand it over to the data team. Thanks. I'll go ahead and share my screen and start my presentation. OK, so hopefully you guys can see that. So I'm going to talk to you about data management overview uh, and the orientation for this. There's really two big tools that we've designed to help with data management. And that is the data foundry and water dams. And they serve two totally different purposes. So before I dive into sort of the team and what we're about, uh, I'm going to talk about these two different tools because um, understanding the differences will be kind of key to understanding what I'm talking about. So the data foundry is a secure collaboration space. It's really a sandbox for working with teams, allows you to collaborate within the guidelines for DOE handling of sensitive information. Um, it's a tool available at your disposal. It was designed for large project multi-team collaborations where something like Uh, John, I think you're on mute. 
I sort of knew the first two or three months. Oh, that's interesting. Back. Sorry about that. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yep. Okay, excellent. So yeah, just starting over, um, talking about data management overview. Um, not sure what happened there with the mute. Um, apologies if some of this is redundant, but uh, we're we'll talking to you about data management. And before I dive into the team and the expectations, there's really two two uh, different tools I'll be discussing and understanding the differences between those tools is pretty key to understanding what I'm talking about. So I'll start there with uh, the two tools we've developed to help you manage data throughout the life cycle of your project. And those are the data foundry and water dams. And they really serve two completely different purposes. And so the data foundry, for example, is a secure collaboration space. Um, it's a place for you to work with your team to share resources across, you know, agencies and um, organizations in a way that conforms to DOE cybersecurity policy for the handling of sensitive data and uh, and allows you to put stuff on the cloud where everyone on the team can access it. Uh, it's it's very similar to a Google Drive or a Dropbox, um, but it has been secured um, and enabled for the handling of sensitive data. So if you are working with data that's subject to proprietary agreement, an NDA or a CRADA or any other agreement where there's potential uh, confidentiality concern, I definitely recommend using the Data Foundry over some of the more publicly available tools. Um, that way you just know that you're within policy and, and managing your data appropriately there. Uh, everything on the Data Foundry is of course backed up and redundant as well. So it's also a great place to store things while you're working with your team. It's really designed to be a sandbox and a collaborative space and uh, and it's it's been designed from the ground up for teams, collaboration, and security. The other end of the coin is Water Dance, which has been designed from the ground up to disseminate public data. So that's our public facing data repository. And it's intended for dissemination. It's where all public data from AMO research and development activities is stored and released from. So if you can imagine, the Data Foundry is kind of the sandbox where you can play around with stuff, organize things, we'll share files with your teams throughout the process. And then when you're ready to publish your data and put it out there to the world, to the greater scientific community, you use water dams. So those are the two big tools. Um, some key contacts on our team, uh, myself, John Weirs, I'm the primary point of contact and the data management lead. You'll also be interacting at some point with RJ Scavo and Nicole Taverna who do our curation for water dams and uh, Jay Huggins is a data migration expert. He helps a lot with big data transfers, you know, things over 10 terabytes, et cetera. Talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but Jay Huggins can help you with um, big data organizational problems and moving large data sets if you, if you find yourself in that position. 99% of the stuff uh, that people are, are producing from these types of activities they're able to just upload through our web interfaces and use the tools normally. Uh, but in those rare cases that you need some, some assistance, you know, we've had projects generate hundreds of terabytes of data. You know, in those cases, we'll step in and help you um, circumnavigate the regular internet so you don't have to deal with bandwidth issues or upload wait times. And if that comes to that, let us know and we can certainly help out. So those are the two tools in the team. Here's another look at the two tools, uh, just a different view, sort of, a, a, so you can see how they're connected. Again, you know, all sorts of groups of people collaborating at the bottom of the data foundry, uh, which allows you to set different permissions for various teams, for various groups or individuals. So, you know, uh, whether you, all the right people have access to the right info, um, especially important, again, if you're working in any sort of proprietary environment or you have NDAs in place. And then once that work is ready for the public world to consume, it gets published to water dams. And there will be setting up uh, a special space in the foundry just for this FOA project and the teams working in there. And with that comes a, a publish button. So within the data foundry, if you want, you can actually just hit you know, send this to water dams and you can select individual files and it will start that submission process into water dams. Water dams is, um, like I said, designed from the ground up to disseminate. Um, it, there are curators involved, making sure that the metadata is good. So there's a whole process there, uh, not too dissimilar from, you know, a standard conference publication process where 
Um, we don't do a full peer review or anything like that, but we, our curators are checking metadata for quality and consistency, um, not the data itself, just the metadata to make sure it's accurately described and discoverable by anyone who's looking for it. Both of these tools are built on OpenEI. Some of you may already be familiar with OpenEI. Um, if you're not, I encourage you to check it out and uh, and sign up for an account. There'll be some links at the end of this presentation. You can go to the tools. But OpenEI has been around since 2009. It was started as part of the US Open Government Initiative and officially recognized by the White House in 2010. And since then, it's been home to dozens and dozens of high profile data management and data collaboration tools. And uh, and water dams and the data foundry are just some of the latest. So we're, we're leveraging a lot of proven technology. There's been a lot of design throughout the years to make both of these tools um, as user friendly and, and seamless as possible. So hopefully you find them easy to use and, uh, and um, intuitive. So working with our team, uh, our engagement strategy for this project, we're gonna work with each team on a specific plan for identifying and addressing your data management and data submission needs and any sensitivities. Some examples there that I've already mentioned, you know, whether or not you're going to need help with data conversion or big data transfer. Um, and we just like to know whether or not you're dealing with any sensitive data so we can keep tabs on that. And, uh, and we'll be developing that workspace within the data boundary for the AMO 2336 work which, uh, as I mentioned, will provide a place for secure collaboration. So that'll all be happening in the next month or so. By November, we'll have um, a secure place for everyone to work, and we'll have met with all the individual teams and got you all set up with the access you need to, to, to house the data of your research, respectively. We're also going to conduct more in-depth data management submission training best practices. So we'll have a training session coming up the next month or two. I'll go into a little more detail on on just a, a high level overview of data management best practices, how to manage data throughout the life cycle of your research project so that uh, with two primary goals, one so that um, your information can be easily yeah, understood by others and doesn't just die when the project ends. And also so that um, it can, uh, again, with the idea of a life cycle so that it can be revisited, expanded upon, and used again and again to build on to future research and innovation. So we want to make sure we're getting the most value out of the data. Um, and there's just a few best practices we'll talk about that will help help you organize your data and future proof it, for lack of a better word. And we'll also do uh, throughout the entire project lifecycle, we'll be doing technical support for users and of Data Foundry and submitters to water dams. So you're always welcome to contact our team at any time with any data management or submission questions. Roles and responsibilities. The awardees are responsible for the proper data management of the data that they're collecting, generating throughout the lifecycle of their project. Um, they're responsible for adhering to signed NDAs and for submitting public data to dams. So there's a requirement to produce something and, and get that work out there. Um, that comes with the nature of federally funded projects. Uh, we operate on the premise that if the taxpayers are paying for it, they should have access to it. And so um, NREL provides the tools and the training and the technical assistance to make that easier. We have the Data Foundry, as I mentioned, to conform to DOE cybersecurity standards for the handling of sensitive data and water dams, of course, built to disseminate public data. Both of these, as I mentioned, are built on OpenAI. They're in a secure cloud. They're utilizing very modern, infinitely scalable architectures. So when it comes time you know, for loading data into the systems, there's no limits on file size or number of files. Uh, we've had projects supplying petabytes of data in the past, and we were able to easily accommodate it. So. Um, don't worry about any of that stuff. If it, if it does seem like your project may be generating, like I said, more than 10 terabytes of data, let us know and we'll happily work with you to accommodate that. Um, just to reiterate, DAMS is built to disseminate to the public data. It, this is a, a network diagram of just a few of the data sharing partners in Water DAMS network. So every submission to water dams, you know, it, it ends up in Google Scholar, ends up on data.gov, ends up in the DOE Data Explorer, Thompson Reuters, science.gov, et cetera. So there, 
dozens of sites out there that we disseminate the metadata records for those data submissions to. And really, it's it's very similar to you know some of those larger journals or conference papers that have a publishing network. And so, uh, I just I think the biggest takeaway here is that water dams is not a place where you send your DOE deliverable. It's not a report to DOE type mechanism. It really is a scientific publication mechanism, and its goal is to get the word out to the greater scientific community. So um, tens of thousands of people will have access to um, what's published on water dams. And so it's a great way to get the word out about all the cool stuff you're doing, to advertise the research projects, and uh, to really um, uh, increase the number of citations you're receiving and things like that. And ultimately, we do this. Um, I really like this quote in the upper right. We're ultimately doing this because uh, from this is from the DOE strategic plan back in 2011. Success should be measured not when a project's completed or an experiment concluded, but when scientific and technical information is disseminated. That's just a really eloquent way of saying if you're if your eureka moment happens in a vacuum and you don't tell anyone about it, then it really didn't have much value. So we have to make sure we get the word out about all the cool research you guys will be doing. So next steps, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have introductory meetings with each project individually and we'll assess the needs and see where we can help out. Um, we'll be providing data foundry access and training, we'll also be doing that data management submission best practices overview. And as I mentioned earlier, throughout the life cycle of the project, we'll be here to help you out, um, provide technical support as needed. There's already an email set up, waterdamshelp at enrol.gov. Uh, that email goes directly to the entire team I showed you on the first slide. So uh, if you need anything, feel free to send an email to that. And it comes to me, it comes to all of our other experts and curators, and we'll be able to help you out. And then links at the bottom uh, when these slides get shared. Um, you can go check out Water Dams, check out Data Foundry. If you haven't already, sign up for an OpenEI account. And then when we do those orientation trainings, we'll get you all set up with the access you need for your individual projects. And then we also have within each tool uh, helpful tutorials and help links, frequently asked questions. And we've also added a, a series of video tutorials on Water Dams um, when you're especially when you're submitting uh, your data to water dams. Uh, if you have any questions about any individual field, um, these video tutorials are very modern. They're only one to two minutes long. You can find the one that answers your specific question and see, watch it and get some really good examples on, on how to properly format metadata and manage your data submission, et cetera. So hopefully that's all very useful and um and i said we put a lot of work into making these tools streamlined and easy to use but we're always open to feedback and assistance so please don't hesitate to reach out thanks any questions okay looks like that and we're, our time is up so thank you everybody for for attending this i think the bottom line is to look for in the next week or two expect you know, a request for or an invitation for when we're going to have these initial uh, orientation and initiation meetings with uh, the NREL and NETL teams. Um, and in the meantime, you know, feel free to reach out to us with any any other questions you might have. Um, but thank you so much for for attending, and we're all looking forward to to working with you uh, over the next year. Thanks all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, thanks.